While it might seem plausible that equal or at least comparable outcomes would exist among people in various social groups in the absence of some biased human intervention or some genetic differences affecting those people's outcomes, neither belief survives the test of empirical evidence. A study of National Merit Scholarship finalists, for example, found that among finalists from five child families, the firstborn was the finalist more often than the other four siblings combined. If there is not equality of outcomes among people born to the same parents and raised under the same roof, why should equality of outcomes be expected or assumed when conditions are not nearly so comparable? Firstborns were also a majority of the finalists in two-child, three-child, and four-child families. Such results are a challenge to believers in either hereditary or environment, as those terms are conventionally used. IQ data from Britain, Germany, and the United States showed that the average IQ of firstborn children was higher than the average IQ of their later-born siblings. Moreover, the average IQ of second-born children as a group was higher than the average IQ of third-born children. A similar pattern was found among young men given mental tests for military service in the Netherlands. The firstborn averaged higher mental test scores than their siblings, and the other siblings likewise averaged higher scores than those born after them. Similar results were found in mental test results for Norwegians. The sample sizes in these studies ranged into the hundreds of thousands. These advantages of the firstborn seem to carry over into later life in many fields. Data on male medical students at the University of Michigan, class of 1968, showed that the proportion of firstborn men in that class was more than double the proportion of later-born men as a group, and more than ten times the proportion among men who were fourth-born or later. A 1978 study of applicants to a medical school in New Jersey showed the firstborn overrepresented among the applicants, and still more so among the successful applicants. Most other countries do not have as high a proportion of their young people go on to a college or university education as in the United States. But whatever the proportion in a given country, the firstborn tend to go on to higher education more often than do later siblings. A study of Britons in 2003 showed that 22% of those who were the eldest child went on to receive a degree, compared to 11% of those who were the fourth child and 3% of those who were the tenth child. A study of more than 20,000 young people in late 20th century France showed that 18% of those males who were an only child completed four years of college, compared to 16% of male firstborn children, and just 7% of males who were fifthborn or later born. Among females, the disparity was slightly larger. 23% who were an only child completed four years of college, compared to 19% who were firstborn, and just 5% of those who were fifthborn or later. Birth order differences persist as people move into their careers. A study of about 4,000 Americans concluded that the decline in average earnings is even more pronounced than the decline in education between those born earlier and those born later. Other studies have shown the firstborn to be overrepresented among lawyers in the greater Boston area and among members of Congress. Of the 29 original astronauts in the Apollo program that put a man on the moon, 22 were either firstborn or an only child. The firstborn and the only child were also overrepresented among leading composers of classical music. Consider how many things are the same for children born to the same parents and raised under the same roof. Race, the family gene pool, economic level, cultural values, educational opportunities— parents' educational and intellectual levels, as well as the family's relatives, neighbors, and friends, and yet the difference in birth order alone has made a demonstrable difference in outcomes. Whatever the general advantages or disadvantages the children in a particular family may have, the only obvious advantage that applies only to the firstborn or to an only child is the undivided attention of the parents during early childhood development. The fact that twins tend to average several points lower IQs than people born singly 
reinforces this inference. Conceivably, the lower average IQs of twins might have originated in the womb, but when one of the twins is stillborn or dies early, the surviving twin averages an IQ closer to that of people born singly. This suggests that with twins, as with other children, the divided or undivided attention of the parents may be key. In addition to quantitatively different amounts of parental attention available to children born earlier and later than their siblings, there are also qualitative differences in parental attention to children in general from one social class to another. Children of parents with professional occupations have been found to hear 2,100 words per hour, while children from working-class families hear 1,200 words per hour, and children from families on welfare hear 600 words per hour. Other studies suggest that there are also qualitative differences in the manner of parent-child interactions in different social classes. Against this background, expectations or assumptions of equal or comparable outcomes from children raised in such different ways have no basis. Nor can different outcomes in schools, colleges, or employment be automatically attributed to those who teach, grade, or hire them, when empirical evidence shows that how people were raised can affect how they turn out as adults. It is not simply that they may have different levels of ability as adults. People from different social backgrounds may also have different goals and priorities, a possibility paid little or no attention in many studies that measure how much opportunity there is by how much upward movement takes place, as if everyone is equally striving to move up. Most notable achievements involve multiple factors, beginning with a desire to succeed in the particular endeavor and a willingness to do what it takes, without which all the native ability in an individual and all the opportunity in a society mean nothing, just as the desire and the opportunity mean nothing without the ability. What this suggests, among other things, is that an individual, a people, or a nation may have some, many, or most of the prerequisites for a given achievement without having any real success in producing that achievement. And yet that individual, that people, or that nation may suddenly burst upon the scene with spectacular success when whatever the missing factor or factors are finally get added to the mix. What can we conclude from all these examples of highly skewed distributions of outcomes around the world? Neither in nature nor among human beings are either equal or randomly distributed outcomes automatic. On the contrary, grossly unequal distributions of outcomes are common, both in nature and among people, in circumstances where neither genes nor discrimination are involved. What seems a more tenable conclusion is that, as economic historian David S. Lanz put it, the world has never been a level playing field. The idea that it would be a level playing field, if it were not for either genes or discrimination, is a preconception in defiance of both logic and facts. Nothing is easier to find than sins among human beings but to automatically make those sins the sole or even primary cause of different outcomes among different peoples is to ignore many other reasons for those disparities. Geographic differences are one among other factors that make for a skewed distribution of outcomes. Coastal peoples have long tended to be more prosperous and more advanced than people of the same race living farther inland while people living in river valleys have likewise tended to be more prosperous and more advanced than people living up in the mountains. Most of the most fertile land in the world is in the temperate zones, and little or none in the tropics. Areas that are both near the sea and in the temperate zones have 8% of the world's inhabited land area, 23% of the world's population, and 53% of the world's gross domestic product. Neither genetics nor discrimination is either necessary or sufficient to account for such skewed outcomes. This does not mean that either genes or discrimination can simply be dismissed as a possibility in any given circumstance, but only that hard evidence would be required to substantiate either of these possibilities, which remain testable hypotheses, without being foregone conclusions. Given how widely, how long, and how strongly each of these two explanations, that is, genes or discrimination, 
has dominated thinking, laws, and policies in various parts of the world, it is no small matter to escape from having painted ourselves into a corner with either of these sweeping preconceptions. Two of the monumental catastrophes of the twentieth century, Nazism and Communism, led to the slaughter of millions of human beings, in the name of either ridding the world of the burden of inferior races or ridding the world of exploiters responsible for the poverty of the exploited. While each of these beliefs might have been testable hypotheses, their greatest political triumphs came as dogmas placed beyond the reach of evidence or logic. Neither Hitler's Mein Kampf nor Marx's Kapital was an exercise in hypothesis testing. While Karl Marx's vast three-volume economic treatise was a far greater intellectual achievement, exploitation was at no point in its 2,500 pages treated as a testable hypothesis, but was instead the foundation assumption on which an elaborate intellectual superstructure was built, and that proved to be a foundation of quicksand. Getting rid of capitalist exploiters in communist countries did not raise the living standards of workers, even to levels common in many capitalist countries where workers were presumably still being exploited, as Marxists conceived the term. Discrimination as an explanation of economic and social disparities may have a similar emotional appeal for many, but we can at least try to treat these and alternative theories as testable hypotheses. The historic consequences of treating beliefs as sacred dogmas beyond the reach of evidence or logic should be enough to dissuade us from going down that road again, despite how exciting or emotionally satisfying political dogmas and the crusades resulting from those dogmas can be, or how convenient in sparing us the drudgery and discomfort of having to think through our own beliefs or test them against facts.